In this interview, I'm going to talk to Steve Coran, who is the VP and Head of AI, Data and Analytics at Capgemini Canada. They've just done a survey uh, that includes AI use by energy companies. Uh, so welcome to the interview, Steve. Terrific. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here today. This is very interesting. I mean, everybody's talking about AI, a lot of it because of the data centers and the uh, increased demand on the power grids for power, uh, especially in the in the U.S. But I've been hearing for a while now about how artificial intelligence is going to be used to make grids, modern grids, more efficient. Uh, mm -hmm. That the there's a lot of concern that you know the yeah. existing grid doesn't move electricity around as efficiently as it could, how might AI fix that problem? Yeah, it is It is a, a key sort of topic and theme that's been out there for at least five years now, right? In terms of how is AI going to enable a greater efficiency of the grid? Um, and if you think about, you know, five years ago, asking that question to where we are today in terms of answering that question, has there been a bigger, a big significant change? And, and the truth of the matter is, no, there hasn't been a big significant change in terms of adoption. So why is that? Like if we unpack what, what is holding us back today in terms of really seeing the full benefit, the full value of what an AI enabled smart grid or just AI enabled grid efficiencies can look like, what's holding us back today? So there's really three things, right? Number one is that in order to take advantage of that AI capability, be it everything from you know your new uh, capabilities around generative AI and agentic AI, even to more of the classic, you know, if I can use that word, classic AI capabilities related to machine learning and deep learning, uh, it requires uh, a degree of, of a modernization to be in place. And this is not only the underlying technologies that will support where that data is stored. You know, are those data is that data stored in a in a in a cloud infrastructure that you can then connect through very simple API calls to AI technologies and, and solutions in order to build some of those products, build some of those efficiencies, bring some of those insights on the grid afford in a more real, you know, real time manner. You do absolutely need to do that. But if we take a look at the actual grid itself, this is also where the migration from AMI 1.0 devices into AMI 2.0 devices is really critical, right? Because having that more multi-directional flow of information and flow of data right from the, the equipment where it's sensing the use to the you know the the head end systems and then into a, a larger repository. That's it. That's a key element of being able to actually deploy AI on top of that data that you're now consuming through your AMI 2.0 devices and actually being able to make insight of. So that's one. You know, there's still an infrastructure modernization around AMI that needs to happen. We're starting to see it very much already in pockets in our country, but it's not at the uh, stage yet where it's critical mass. So there's one gap. Number two, I touched upon a little bit already, which is you know, do we have the right infrastructure in place, AI enabled infrastructure in place to actually do anything more than a simple proof of concept, a simple proof of value? You know, I've been deploying AI solutions in uh, with our utilities, both power distribution and generation since about 2018. Back in 2018, when we built many of these uh, sort of AI uh, solutions, they're very much kind of running off the side of, of somebody's desk, it's kind of way to think about it, really not scalable to the enterprise level. Great for a department, great for a team, because it really does create some efficiencies for that one team or department, but nothing really at the enterprise level. That is still a gap today. We have many utilities in our or in, across the country that have started to modernize their data infrastructure to be able to take advantage of these capabilities. And that's critical because if we don't have the modern data infrastructure there, the cost of sustaining the AI solutions is significantly higher than expected. And one of our most recent uh, you know, Capgemini Research Institute reports, we showed that about 60% of, of Canadian businesses that have used AI over the last 24 months uh, have reported sticker shock in terms of the cost of sustaining those AI solutions. And that's really coming down to having the right data and technology stack to support AI today. That, that's a gap today. Third gap, not related to technology, not related to infrastructure at all. I'll tell you the third gap that I continue to see today in 2025 that I saw in 2018 is the essentially the gap around the ways of working to really take advantage of the capabilities in its most fullest robust capabilities. I do, I do believe utilities need to learn from other regulated industries like telecommunications that have started to adjust their operating models, adjust the, the way they deliver services around the capabilities of the solution. And it's no longer 
now trying to fit that capability into a legacy way of delivering services. It's now modernizing the way you deliver those services so that you can actually take advantage of the, uh, the capability. And that's an area where utilities kind of generalizing here today, but utilities today in Canada have not yet looked at modernizing and changing the way services are delivered in order to take advantage of the technology and still very much trying to take a, a legacy approach of trying to fit the technology into an existing way of services being delivered. So it's really those three gaps that we have to get through in order to really get out of this, you know, POC death valley that sometimes our you know, utilities are, are stuck in in terms of AI adoption to get to the stage of actual benefit to the enterprise and, and scalable and sustainable in a cost effective way. Steve, uh, there's a lot to unpack in that. And I want to start by giving you a case study, if you will, Please. of an interview I did last week. And so it was an American company. And mm -hmm. when they put up a, a wind or solar farm, uh, there are mm -hmm. a lot of devices involved. And all of the devices use different protocols and languages. And yes. so what was happening is there was this stream of data going to the system operator that wasn't integrated, all sorts, you know, they were all different. And so the mm -hmm. operator would almost manually have to translate them so they could make a decision a half an hour down the road. Mm -hmm. what, what this company did was put a computer in front of all that data, translate it into one language, which then the system operator could implement and act on almost in, instantaneously. Right. That's, that's one case study, one example yes. of a modernized grid. Yes. And I'm sure there are dozens and hundreds of, of more we could talk about. Yes. But are you suggesting that the Canadian utilities at this point aren't at that stage of innovating? No, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. What I'm suge suggesting is to take advantage of the capabilities around AI. There are, you know, there's a limitation that every company, utilities and other regulated companies need to be able to address, right? And their limitation is really two dimensions. There's always going to be a limitation in terms of the human element of, of being able to scale the use of AI. And I'll unpack that in a minute. And then there's a technology limitation, right? Everybody today, every single utility in today in Canada that I've spoken to is absolutely experimenting, innovating with AI. And some are really seeing really good results. When I go back to my time, back to now 2018, 2019, we had a couple of large power generation companies in our, in, in our country start looking at, uh, for example, the use of AI for things like uh, doing the scheduling of uh, planned outages and planned maintenance. And if anybody knows that world you know, really deeply, you know, you'll know that that is a 52-week endeavor, right? To come up with a proper schedule, to take down one of the generators, to do all the maintenance and all the right sequencing, making sure that, you know, the pressure valve is done before the release valve. All that is very intric intricate, takes a lot of people, a lot of energy, and a lot of time over 52 weeks to come up with that schedule. And we proved back in 2018 and 2019 that you can actually do that with the support of an AI, not to replace your very intelligent engineers, but to complement them and be able to do that same endeavor that took 52 weeks, essentially in, a, in about a month, right? So a significant time saving, significant cost savings, great innovation demonstrated by those utilities at that time who were experimenting with AI to find this kind of you know, use case where you can innovate and generate an ROI. And that's great. And that was confined to one department. Our uh, Capgemini Research Institute report though has showed there are a significant cross section of companies now across the country that are not only just experimenting with AI, but are truly like scaling the use of AI, right? So actually embedding it into most of their, uh, most of their business processes in most of their departments and most of their functions. And when, you, when we look at that uh, report and we started to see that, hey, you know, there's like 40% of organizations, for example, in telecommunications that have really started to see the impact and the value of our uh, and the ROI around, around the use of AI. How does that compare to utilities? Utilities today is you know, probably about half that, actually less than half that. It's about 18, 19% of utilities. And so when we think about why is that happening? Why is the innovation not at the same scale as another regulated industry like telecommunications? It goes back to the pieces that I mentioned, which is we need to modernize the infrastructure. We need to modernize the ways of working. And we need to make sure, you know, along with that, that there's a very clear uh, vision for where AI is going to be used because it's not a magic bullet. It's not, yeah, it's not uh, today at the state of maturity where every single use case will have an exceptional ROI. 
But we do know for utilities, for example, that if you target three areas today with the technology as mature as it is, you will get an ROI. Those three areas are look at AI to improve how you are serving your customers, serving your ratepayers, making sure that you're enabling your contact center and customer service teams with the support of an AI solution to serve them better. Number two is look at uh, AI for enhancing your own internal operations, be it in IT, in finance, where you can use this technology today to just do things that are much more cost effective than, than they were you know, 10 years ago. And uh, number three is in the, in the field, in operations, looking at it for systems optimization, for planning, for plan averages, making sure you're rolling out the trucks to the, uh, the service calls at the right time proactively as well. And we know these are actual applications of the technology today that can provide the ROI. So that's hopefully clears, clarifies you know, the comment that I made. Steve, uh, one of the, th I mean, this strikes me as a classic uh, technology adoption issue. And so the, you know, the AI is along the bottom of the S curve mm -hmm. and it's developing and developing and developing. Then it gets to the inflection point where, hey, now it's delivering enough value and the risk has come down. And so it is competitive with existing technologies. So let's mm -hmm. assume that it's kind of around that in inflection point, because that's what it sounds right. like to me. What, how can companies like utilities and yes. how can regulators and maybe even government who sets policy, what changes can those entities make to speed up the efficient adoption of AI? Yeah, that is a wonderful, wonderful question. I love that question. So I, I love the fact that you touched on the, uh, the, the ownership and accountability, not only with the utility, but it's also with their, the respective energy boards. It's also with the various levels of governments, right? So let's Let's answer that question in terms of what each, can each of these layers do in order to drive greater adoption and to drive, drive that efficiency. I would say at the top of the house or you know, at the, the federal level, uh, I love the initiative that we've seen by the federal government around the national AI compute strategy, trying to de develop more compute power and capacity and capability within the, the boundaries of our, of our great nation. That's a, a lovely, uh, a terrific endeavor. And we know um, there's already um, you know, uh, inroads that are being made capacity that's now being made available today in order to do compute uh, and inference within Canada versus, you know, having to be concerned about, you know, as I send my data over to an AI model, you know, where is that AI model actually consuming that data? Is it, you know, is it in a country that, for example, that I'm not particularly comfortable with exposing my data to? And now the national AI compute strategy, you know, really addresses that. So we got like a check in the box that's that, that's starting to form in terms of what governments can do to d drive the degree of adoption in Canada. I do believe there's additional role that governments can play. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, being part of a, a great global organization like Capgemini, about three to four times every week, I will get a call or get a ping from in LinkedIn or elsewhere from somebody from somewhere around the globe who's interested in coming to Canada to drive uh, you know, AI innovation to bring their talents around AI from another country here as well. Now, you know, I believe there's a multitude of factors that they're, why they're reaching out to me. I don't believe that one of the reasons is because they wanna come and try an authentic pea meal bacon sandwich. I think they're, they're attracted by, you know, the stability, they're attracted by the, uh, the degree of, of fantastic organizations and uh, research institutions and post-secondary institutions are here as well. And we need to tap into that. So we're not doing that quite yet, but we need to tap into that. Let's get down to the regulator level. What can regulators do? I think we're already starting to see that organizations and, and regulatory bodies are trying to uh, apply a degree of, of uh, importance as well as emphasis around making sure that these investments that are being proposed for smart grid, for AMI 2.0 uh, implementations, as well as you know, better use of the taxpayer ratepayer dollar is becoming more of a focal point. And I think the connection point to how AI can be used to drive that strategic priority for the regulator needs to be hardened a little bit, right? And it's not necessarily a recommendation, but exposure that the regulator can provide to uh, a, a utility around, hey, there's this story from this utility in the UK that has driven a seven, you know, a 70% increase in customer satisfaction as a result of, you know, being able to leverage uh, AI technologies to improve average call handling time to personalize the information that a contact center agent has when talking to that uh, that resident. And we need to you know, improve the visibility 
to drive a degree of kind of a spark of innovation. And I believe that's the type of role a, a regulator can play, as well as uh, leveraging that, that technology to drive more certainty around these investments as well. Now, if we assume that's there, then there is absolutely an ownership that uh, the leaders across our fine utilities across, across the country have in terms of the dr driving this innovation and leveraging this, this capability. And I would um, you know, ask those individuals in those decision-making roles to kind of consider the three factors that we've talked about. How are you going to unleash the power of the technology for your, your people, making sure you have the right ways of working, the right operating model? Um, how, are, how are we also going to make sure that that technology is used in a responsible way, in a cost-effective way? So having the right guardrails in place, but also the right strategy around these are the areas we're going to focus the use of AI and the adoption of, of AI. And then number three is having a clear, um, you know, clear vision and ROI for what a, you know, what your strategic priorities are that you're going to enable and accelerate with uh, with AI. Where we see, you know, organizations struggle with the adoption of AI. You know, we talked about technology challenges. We've talked about human scale challenges. But another factor is where it's the, you know, the 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 focus around AI is completely disconnected from the strategic priorities of that utility. And so I think those are things that we can all do across the different layers just to improve the, the adoption and the innovation that we're seeing. Steve, I'm going to ask you to do a little <clears throat> imagining here. Yes. So imagine A.E. Rogers uh, adoption bell curve. Yes. On the left, you've got innovators and early adopters. We're all familiar with that language. Yes. And then as you move the right up the curve, you get to the middle, to the early majority, the late majority. And way yes. over on the other side, you have the laggards. Yes. If I asked you to put the Canadian power yes. sector, utilities yes. and so on, on that curve, where would you put it? That's a great question. So some people listening to this may assume that I would place them into the, the firmly in the laggard column. And that's actually not the case. You know, I have the, the distinct privilege of being able to serve utilities across the country. Uh, and while they are not at the top of the curve, they're sort of in the middle between the laggard to the top with a strong desire to do more. I have not spoken with one CIO of a utility over the last 12 months who doesn't understand the potential of this technology and are looking to, to actually adopt in order to drive in, you know, efficiencies, uh, drive better experience for uh, the ratepayer, the taxpayer as well. So that's not, th not the case by, by any means. I think what we're we're seeing is, you know, if you ask me that question again, for example, in 24 months, I would say utilities in Canada will be, you know, firmly in in the the column of of, of companies and organizations that have uh, started to use AI in a meaningful way and receive uh, seen an ROI in a meaningful way. So they're very much exiting the laggard column, right? Rightly, kind of firmly in the middle between that laggard and the top of the tier. And the, the direction and the arrow is pointing in the right direction, in my, my opinion, meaning very much focusing more and more, you know, in allocation of budget to be able to use the technology in a meaningful way to drive, again, a meaningful impact to their businesses. Steve, this has been fascinating. Uh, I've, I feel like I've, uh, I've just attended a masterclass on where AI is in the power sector. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we'll have you back in 24 months to see if, in fact, a power sector <laughs> is adopting AI at a greater pace. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me on your show. It was, it was quite fun. I appreciate it.